one. All right, hey guys, so this is chapter two. This is digestion and absorption. And I'm gonna share my screen and pull up PowerPoint and we'll get started. Okay, digestion and absorption, two different things, by the way. <clears throat> so what are we gonna learn? The learning objectives. Um, we're gonna be able to explain the path the food takes during the digestive process and the muscular actions of digestion. We're gonna describe the actions and origins of all the digestive secretions. We make all kinds of secretions to help us break down the food that we eat. We're gonna be able to describe the anatomical details of the GI tract and the features and activities of intestinal cells that facilitate nutrient absorption. Like where does the food actually get absorbed in that process of moving through the tract? We're gonna describe the process of nutrient delivery. So how does the stuff get from your digestive tract into your bloodstream and to where it needs to go. And we're gonna talk about the vascular system and how that's involved um, and different types of lipoproteins and, and all the nutrients that are involved and how they transport. We're gonna describe how hormones, nerves, and bacteria influence the health and activities of the GI tract. Everyone in here, fun fact, you have about five pounds of bacteria in your gut, five pounds. For real. And you need them. Like you have E. coli. Ascaric E. coli lives in your gut, but it's kept in check by other bacteria. So there's this perfect kind of balancing act that happens. The body's amazing. And I've been doing this for over 30 years and it's still amazing to me. So uh, we're going to also explain the causes and effects of foodborne illnesses in humans and the way to ensure food safety. So let's talk about the anatomy of the digestive tract. And what I will also do for you guys is I have another lecture from my nursing classes um, on digestion. And so I'll give you access to that too on the YouTube channel if you wanna take a look at it. It goes into a little more detail, probably more than you need, but if you're interested, you know, you can certainly take a look. So your digestive tract is selective. Um, things that are nutritional to you are broken into particles and they get absorbed things that are not nutritious or that you don't need, they're left undigested and they're excreted, right? In the form of feces. And your GI tract is basically this big flexible muscular tube that really goes from your mouth to your anus. And I laugh every time I say your anus and I'm just gonna do that till the day I die because I find the word funny. So, um, and nutrients enter the rest of the body through cells. It's actually through the walls of the digestive tract which is pretty amazing. So that next slide is kind of a, a little diagram of what your digestive tract looks like. And digestion actually starts the minute you put something into your mouth, right? The minute you masticate, mas masticate. The chewing process begins, then you have salivary glands that release saliva and that serves a purpose. It helps to break down the food, right? And then the food moves from the mouth and it goes down the esophagus and it goes through the lower esophageal sphincter, which is kind of like this little one-way trap door that lets the food go from the esophagus boop, into the stomach. And then while it's in the stomach, the stomach can expand a lot, a lot, right? Anybody that's ever had like a big Thanksgiving dinner and then felt like they wanted to die afterwards, right? Because you're just so full. Your stomach can really expand a lot, but it's not good to stretch it out like that. Um, but while the food's in the stomach, the stomach will release hydrochloric acid. Another fun fact, that's the strongest acid that there is. So if you ever wanted to get rid of like a human body, bones and all, if I could take the hydrochloric acid from everyone's stomach in this room and put it in a big vat, we could get rid of a body. Easy peasy. What's that? <laughs> I knew that before Breaking Bad, but anyway. That was a good show though. I did love that show. Yeah. Um, okay. So the stomach releases the hydrochloric acid. The acid breaks the food down into a substance called thyme, C-H-Y-M-E, which kind of looks like baby food, oatmeal, like pure blue and mush, right? So when that happens, it leaves the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and goes into the small intestine. The small intestine is about 20 feet in an average size adult. Um, and this is the way to remember DJ ilium. It's the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ilium. That's the way to remember the three parts of the small intestine. DJ ilium. 
it works. I know it's corny, but still it works. Um, and as the food, as that chyme moves through the small intestine, that is where the crux or most of the absorption of nutrients takes place, right? So the small intestine is really the place where, oh, you electrolytes draws it out of that chyme and pulls it through the wall and into the bloodstream. Proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and everything that you need. Whatever is left by the time it gets through that 20 or so feet goes to the large intestine, AKA the colon, right? That's mostly about water and poop. That's what the large intestine is mostly about, right? That's where the stool is actually starting to become formed. And as it moves through the ascending transverse and descending colon into the rectum and then out Uranus, that's the waste, right? So that's, that's a basic rudimentary look at how digestion occurs, you know, what the roots are. But there are lots of other things that happen on the way and lots of other organs that are involved like the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas, right? So we'll talk more about that as we move on. So, and basically everything that I just explained to you, that's what these next slides are, you know, where digestion begins in the mouth, the mouth to the esophagus. Um, there is a small flap called the epiglottis and it's right at the base of the throat. When you have to take a pill or something, most people will drink and put their head back, right? Don't do that. You're more likely to aspirate if you do that. Chin down when you swallow. That forces the epiglottis into a closed position over the trachea. So the food or drink can't go in the trachea. It's forced to go into the esophagus. Chin down. Okay. All right. See, I'm just a font of stuff for you guys to go home with. All right. Uh, okay. The digestive organs. So we talked about the stomach small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, the anus. Um, and then, so now we're moving on to the involuntary muscles and the glands. So when we talk about the word motility, it's almost like mobility. And what it means is there are these muscular contractions that happen and they move, not just food, food, drink, air through your digestive tract. Have you ever been sitting and you hear your stomach growl? What's well, not your stomach, it's your intestines. And what you're hearing is hyperactive bowel sounds, probably because you haven't eaten and there's a lot of air moving through and the air makes a lot of noise, right? So that's what you're actually hearing. Um, peristalsis is the word for those muscular contraction. They're like waves that the intestines make to kind of push everything, air, food, drink down through the system. And then there's something called segmentation. So every so often, um, the intestines will push some of what's in there, kind of like back up a few inches, just like back it up. That's the only thing in your body that's not a one-way street all the time. Everything in your body, South Philadelphia, it's a one-way street, right? If something's going the wrong direction, it's bad, right? Except this one thing the segmentation. And it's just pushing back just like an inch or two just to get more digestive juices or more enzymes. Maybe it needs some more lipase or amylase. And we'll talk about those different uh, hormones that come from the pancreas to help absorb food. So it happens once in a while. Then there's a nice little chart that goes through the involuntary muscles and the glands, talks about peristalsis and segmentation. Um, so in the GI tract, those muscles help to get those intestinal contents and liquefy them even more, right? Uh, stomach muscles are the thickest and strongest, by the way, of the whole digestive tract because the stomach is able to take whatever's in it and literally, you know, kind of crush it and break it down. Um, and then their gastric juices like the hydrochloric acid, which is the most fun one, I think. Okay. And that you don't need to know about the stomach muscles. I mean, they're, they're longitudinal. They're different types of muscles that all kind of work together to help that squeezing action of the stomach. So the process of digestion. So what is digestion? So digestion takes the food and renders it into basic units separated by what kind of nutrient it is. Is it a carbohydrate, AKA a starch or sugar, right? Is it a fat or is it a protein, right? And then you have five different organs that all work with your digestive system 
to help basically different kinds of juices, enzymes, et cetera, that help with digestion. Your salivary glands in your mouth, right, helps break down the food. Hydrochloric acid in the stomach. The small intestine ha has some different enzymes in there. Um, the pancreas is the big one because the pancreas releases lipase, which lipase lipids helps absorb lipids. Amylase, amylase helps absorb carbohydrates or starches. And then trypsin, and trypsin is about um, protein, helping to absorb protein, okay? And the liver secretes bile and it gets stored in your gallbladder. So when you eat that McDonald's crap with all the fat in it, the gallbladder will release into the main hepatic duct, will go through the um, main bile duct rather into the intestines to help break down all that fat that you just ate. That's the main, bile has two main purposes, to help you absorb and metabolize fats and to make your poop brown. True. Uh, digestion in the mouth. So we talked about saliva and saliva is important. It also protects your teeth, believe it or not, from bacteria, you know, sitting on there and causing damage. Um, the salivary glands don't have a lot of effect on like fats and proteins or vitamins and minerals, that kind of thing. Basically, it's more of an enzymatic action that saliva has. Um, the stomach, the gastric juices we talked about, you know, the water enzymes and hydrochloric acid. Um, and there's this lining of mucus, which is pretty cool, that actually protects the stomach cells from its own acid. Anybody ever have heartburn? Right. That, that's uncomfortable, right? You get that burning feeling. So what's going on is that hydrochloric acid, it's supposed to stay in your stomach, right? If it, for whatever reason, something you're pregnant, when you're pregnant, you will get heartburn. You just will. The bigger you are, the, the worse the heart, because the baby's pushing on your stomach and pushing that acid up and it burns, right? So that's why that acid is not supposed to be anywhere else except in your stomach. That's the only place that can handle that strong of an acid. Right? Um, so we talked about lipase. Um, so stomach acid helps digest sucrose and sucrose. What do you think that is? What kind of substance? What does it sound like? Sugar, right? Yeah, right, sugar. Um, and then you have um, these protein carriers that are in your stomach and in your gut that are necessary. It's called intrinsic factor and extrinsic factor. I know it's not here, but I'll just tell you that you need to absorb particularly vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 is essential for building red blood cells, which you gotta have and also for neurological issues. Um, a vitamin B12 deficiency can be fatal, even really bad, right? So when people get older, sometimes they don't have as much intrinsic factor and they need B12 shots. You'll see a lot of that in nursing homes and stuff. Like everybody gets a B12 shot once a month. Um, salivary amylase gets inactivated. So this, this set, the saliva from your mouth, when that hits your stomach, the hydrochloric acid just squashes it, right? So then with the pancreas and the liver add digested juices. Pancreatic juice digests fats, proteins, and carbs, which I talked about already. Um, there's something called a bicarbonate, which is a neutralizer, if you will, right? And that neutralizes the acid that's in the chyme that goes into the small intestine. Um, the bile I talked about already, it emulsifies the fat, helps you absorb and metabolize fat. Anybody ever have their gallbladder out? Anybody? Okay. And right afterwards, the worst thing you can do is eat anything fatty because you will have the worst pain in the world because you don't have that stored bile to help you absorb and metabolize the fat. So if you eat a fatty meal, you will get pain, horrible cramps, and you will be running to the bathroom with something called steatorrhea, which is fatty diarrhea. Sounds good, right? You see, you see your faces. I love it. Um, it, it's so fatty that it will float in the water of the toilet. Yeah, for real, for real. Okay, um, let's see. I, I basically already talked about this, the digestion in the small and large intestines. Um, let's see, organic nutrients. So the digestion rate, how quickly food gets digested depends on what you ate, what kind of food it is. Carbohydrates, sugars, starches, tend to be digested the quickest. Think about Halloween and think about little kids and all that candy. And they're like, right? 
But then within about an hour or two, they're right. So carbs are in fast, out fast, right? They, they, they get absorbed and digested real quick. And then they're out real quick. That's why you get the high and then you crash. Okay. Um, fat is the slowest. It takes a while for your body to digest fat. Uh, let's see. And we talked a little bit about the bacteria. Um, so many different kinds of bacteria live inside of you. It's like a whole little city going on in there of all these different bacteria that help maintain this like really specific balance, right? To keep your intestinal health, we'll say. They help protect you against infection, right? So there are lot, lots of good reasons for all those. Um, there's a big fad going on with probiotics, right? People drinking like these probiotic shakes. Now, if you're on an antibiotic because you got, you know, sinus infection or something, a probiotic is a good idea because what can happen is an antibiotic, especially if it's a broad spectrum, in other words, it kills all different kinds of bacteria, that'll kill some of the good bacteria that you have in your gut that helps keep the bad bacteria at bay. And what can happen is yeast. So for any woman that's ever had a yeast infection, not fun. You can also get oral candidiasis, which is a yeast infection in your mouth. And that's not fun either, okay? Um, so probiotics are acidophilus, lactobacillus. They are these live cultures, if you will, like you find them in yogurt, different kinds of yogurt, and they help to balance it out while you're on the antibiotic. But you don't need probiotics if you're not on an antibiotic. Harvard just did a study. A matter of fact, I'll post it when I get home tonight. Um, so you, you can read it if you want. People are taking these probiotics just all the time because it's like this fad thing or whatever. And they're actually winding up with severe intestinal infections because you're screwing with something that's already nearly perfect. Like if it's not broke, don't fuck with it, okay? Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So digestion in the small and large intestine. So carbs, fats, and proteins get basically broken down into their smallest units. Disassembled is the way they describe it here. Um, and vitamins, minerals, and water get absorbed as they're kind of passing through, right? Anything that's not digested. The best example I can give you is cellulose. Cellulose is fiber. If you eat fruit, like let's say you eat a pear or a peach, you eat the skin. The skin is the best fiber in the world. So what it is, it's cellulose. It goes through your whole digestive tract. It does not get digested or absorbed, but it holds on to water. So when it gets to the large intestine, it keeps your poop moist. So it's easier to go. And that's how fiber works. It's undigested cellulose, right? Uh, let's see. Yeah, and like I said, the small intestine really does the heavy lifting. It does most of the digestion and absorption for your GI tract. Um, once it gets to the large intestine, the colon, it's all about water and poop, you know, making making sure there's some water in there and the, forming the feces and getting rid of the waste, the excrement, right? Uh, let's see. And so they talk a little bit more about the absorption, the small intestine. Uh, in the small intestine, you have these little, they are almost like little fingers and they're called villi and microvilli. And they basically kind of help, um, they help with the absorption of the different nutrients and they help kind of move things along like little fingers to kind of help push things through. And there's some nice pictures on that slide. Uh, let's see. There's so many diets out there. There's so many there's the paleo diet, there's the keto diet, there's Atkins diet, there's Weight Watchers, so they don't call it that anymore. They call it W or whatever they call it. You know, all you have to do is kind of eat okay. Really, there's no diet because when you diet, two things are gonna happen. First of all, you're gonna feel like oh, dieting and I can't eat anything I like and this sucks. And so when you have your meltdown, not if, but when, and you go, I'm sick of this crap. You're going to eat probably a lot of crap that maybe you normally wouldn't have eaten, right? Because you're going to feel like you, 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 you've been suffering, you know? You, right. And crash that they're the worst. People whose weight goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. That's a strain on your body. 
and it really, it really will take a toll over time. You know, if you want to be healthy, it's just, you, you can eat McDonald's once. I have like a Big Mac probably once every three to six months. I'll just be in my car and like, oh my God, I want a Big Mac and I'll go get a Big Mac, you know? But that's it. Like I don't typically eat fast food, but I don't have, like, I'm not eating kale chips. All right. Like I eat chicken, I eat fish, I eat steak, beef. I eat, but today I had a burger with provolone cheese. It was very good. Right. So, and, and have some vegetables and don't eat a lot of sugar and don't think Starbucks is coffee because it's just a freaking milkshake. All right. Let's keep it real. Real talk. Starbucks is just milkshakes. Right. And loaded with calories and costs a lot. The, suck, I have one daughter-in-law who's like, I have to have Starbucks. And I'm like, she's so bougie. Like Starbucks, it, it's just overpriced milkshakes. If you want a milkshake, go get a McDonald's milkshake. Their milkshakes are actually good. It's like heroin. I don't need to pay rent. I need Starbucks. Like, you know, it's like, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, we all have something, you know, like I said, I'm 60 at this point, you guess what? Right. I'm no quitter, but, um, but I do take care of myself, you know, otherwise I, like I said, I eat well, I get plenty of exercise, blah, 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 blah. Um, but Starbucks, like $8, I do that math. That's in, that's crazy. But I work there, so like you get a discount. Five days, that's the free drink every day. Oh well, if you're getting yeah. it, I know, but but still, if you're just getting a coffee, it's not so bad. But if you're getting like a venti latte, caro macchiato, whatever they are, I and mean, I've I've been to Starbucks once, like literally when they first opened, and I was like, all right, this I'm okay. Like I make coffee at home. Like my coffee's really good. I like the taste of coffee. Yeah, you know. I like the taste of coffee. So, but to each his own. Um, but yeah, they're they're milkshakes, and they have a lot of calories, and that that don't do anything for you. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm stuck. I'm gonna have my Starbucks. I mean, if that's your one thing, like I said, if you everybody has something. If you are good, otherwise, you know what I'm saying, right? Okay. Um, so food combining. There's some truth to eating certain foods with other foods. Example, a great example is this one about iron. So vitamin C, any foods that contain vitamin C or drinks like orange juice, for example, when you take vitamin C foods or drinks with food containing iron, it helps with the absorption. But don't ever take iron with dairy because it inhibits the absorption. Right, fun, more fun facts. Ah, uh, so the bloodstream and the lymphatic system. So your body, your body's like a well-wheeled machine. Like it's crazy what it does and how all these different systems, even though they're kind of independent, but they all work together, right? So your bloodstream and your lymphatic system, your lymphatic system is all about protecting you from infection, basically. And everywhere that you have blood, you have lymph flowing through your body, right? Um, and it helps to remove certain nutrients um, there are water soluble nutrients and there are fat soluble. Let's talk about the vitamins, for example. Easy way to remember it A, D, E, and K. They're your fat soluble vitamins. The others are water soluble. So, like emergency and um, what's the other one? There's another one which like loads of vitamins. Yeah, well, it's, there's some over the counter stuff that's like, take this and we'll shorten your life of your cold. That's not true. That's a lie. Here's why. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. You can't take more than you need because you will just urinate it out. Your body can't do anything with it, number one. Number two, a cold is caused by a virus. Viruses are self-limiting. In other words, they run their course. So don't waste your money. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right, so now triglycerides. Anybody ever heard about somebody? Oh my God, his triglycerides were 300, right? Triglycerides are just another name for molecules of fat that can actually reside in your bloodstream. And if you have high levels of them, they can actually build up like, 
like plaque inside your arteries and they can cause strokes and heart attacks and all that fun stuff. Um, but the triglycerides, so the fat molecules from the intestinal cells got kind of clumped together and they cluster with these other kinds of proteins and they form these things called chylomicrons, which is a lipoprotein. It's a fat and it's a protein that's kind of globbed together, right? Um, and that goes into the lymphatic system and it eventually gets to your bloodstream. And again, if there's, you need some, we all need some fat, good fat, not the bad fat. You can't eliminate fat from your diet. That's not good either, because there are some things that you need. Example, you have a blood brain barrier around your brain, neuralgia, nerve cells, and some fat. Your kidneys, right? Your flank area, pads of fat protect your kidneys, right? So you need some fat, right? But it's gotta be the good fat and you can't have too much of it because when triglyceride levels are elevated, cholesterol levels, are elevated, especially the bad cholesterol, which is the LDL. The HDL is the good cholesterol. H is healthy. LDL is bad. And you have too much of that, again, builds up. Just picture a garden hose that's like that big, right? But then all that plaque is inside and now it's only that big. And the blood is like trying to get through and it can't. And that's, you know, that's the makings of a heart attack. Yes. So once the plaque is there, you can prevent it from getting worse, you know, but we have to usually do something. I call it a roto rooter, which is just a fun name for it, um, where they go into the artery and they actually like carotid arteries are notorious for, you know, somebody's got high cholesterol, high triglycerides for plaque buildup. And they do a carotid endarterectomy. And what that is, is they go in and they strip the inside, take all that plaque out to open up the artery. So can you undo the damage? Sadly, you can't undo it, but you can prevent it from getting worse, right? So it's never it's never too late to change. Like, I don't care how old you are, unless like unless you're 90. Because if you're nine, like when if I make it to 90, I'm going to do heroin, Molly. I'm trying it all. Because at 90, mm -hmm. nothing good happens at 90. You know what I mean? So it's like, I might as well enjoy myself. Right. Okay. So does that help? You know, it's, it's sad, but, you know, people can have these occlusions and they usually don't find out until I worked in the ER in the city and every winter it was inevitable. We get a little snow and a little old guy that never did anything, you know, that didn't move since he retired, but decided to go shovel and keels over in his front yard. I mean, all the time, because you don't realize it until you start exerting yourself. And then it's like, oh. Uh, Boom, you know, and your myocardium can't get enough oxygenated blood. That's an MI. It's a heart attack. So. All right, let's see. The vascular system. So blood gets carried by arteries. Arteries are the, the vessels that carry blood away from the heart to the body, right? oxygenated blood. And they go into little arterioles and then into capillaries. Capillaries are the little the capillary beds where the arteries meet the veins. And that's when the blood has already dropped off all of its oxygen. And now it's got to make the return trip via your veins back to the heart and lungs to pick up more oxygen and do it again. Um, you have a portal system, the hepatic portal system, which is kind of like a separate vascular system, but it's connected, right? But it's for the liver um, and it's, the liver and the kidneys actually. And those blood vessels can actually have wear and tear on them because of things like excessive fat, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they can actually cause a lot of problems with hypertension that's, that's recalcitrant or refractory. So it doesn't respond to um, like simple medications or lifestyle changes. High blood pressure is a big problem, right? For a lot of people in this country. And it's the silent killer. So people don't know they have it right? There's no symptom. If somebody says, oh, I know when my pressure is high, I get a nosebleed. If you're getting a nosebleed, your pressure's so high, like you're like a stroke waiting to happen. Not cool, right? Or I get headaches. It's, again, if you're getting symptoms like that. It's really high, right? That's dangerous. So don't play with that. Uh, let's see what else we got here. 
the lymphatic system. I mean, uh, the transport of lipids. Okay, so now we get into that cholesterol thing. So there's also VLDL, which is very low density lipoprotein when we talk about cholesterol. Um, and that's made mostly by your liver. So some people genetically have high cholesterol, right? So, sometimes there's not a lot they can do, but they can still, you know, try to eat right and exercise to counter affect their genetics. So you can fight your genetics to a degree. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you know that you've got like a predisposed history, family history, mom had high cholesterol, dad had high cholesterol, grandparents, whatever, then that's your warning. Like, oh, you know, now that I'm younger, let me start taking good care of myself so I can kind of counter affect that genetic piece, right? Because you can't change your genetics. You know, it's, it's what you're stuck with. Your family's your family. It's not always fun either. <laughs> and then you have your LDL, which is your low density lipoprotein, and then the HDL, and that's the good one, right? That's the healthy. That's the one that actually helps keep your arteries clear of plaque. So the higher the HDL, the lower the LDL, the healthier you are, right? That's the goal. You're looking for those numbers, right? And that's basically, that's what I just said. I keep beating these slides. Like I say it and then I go to the next slide. I'm like, I already said that. Um, and factors that are included in raising that HDL and lowering that LDL, keeping your weight at a healthy level. Saturated fats are bad. There are two things that are the devil saturated fats and salt. Um, that's it. Those two things will kill you, right? If you let them. So you have to really manage, like there's so much salt in food already. I don't even use a salt shaker in my house and I don't have high blood pressure. Like I, you know, lucky. Um, but I just, I stay away from salt because salt is very bad, especially as you get older. Right. It's one of the number one reasons for exacerbations of congestive heart failure in patients is that they eat processed foods, lunch meat, right? Um, Slim Jim, which are delicious. I love Slim Jim too. Like, I know it's some people are like, ew, you like what you like. Can I tell you? Um, but they're not good for you, right? Not good for you. Um, get some fiber in your diet and physical activity. There was also an article I read, which made me so happy. It said, sitting is the new smoking. I was like, yes, there's hope. Uh, okay, so gastrointestinal hormones and nerve pathways. Everything that your body does is to keep you in a state of homeostasis. The word homeostasis means that your body is, is running in a perfectly balanced state. All the systems are a go, like everything's running the way it's supposed to be running, right? Um, here they talk about prebiotics, probiotics, right? Encourage the growth of activity, which can reduce the risk of infections, blah, 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 blah. But only when you need them, when you need them. Um, the system at its best. So, you know, basically everything that you do, including what you eat affects how you feel. So trying to get enough sleep or at least a reasonable amount of sleep, trying to get some physical activity, trying to manage stress and anxiety. Everybody has stress and anxiety. And anyone who looks at you and says, I don't, not true, everyone does. But how do you manage it? You don't let it manage you. Stress is also something else up there with fat and salt that will kill you, right? And so you have to find ways to manage the stress so that it's not running your life. Right. And we'll talk more about that too, you know, throughout these classes. Um, your state of mind, stress, anxiety, all those things, they make you feel crappy physically, right? You will have physiological symptoms. So it's important to, you know, learn ways. And I, and I have a lot of help plants about a lot of different stuff, right? Foodborne illnesses. We're almost done. Okay. Um, they say it's the leading food safety concern in this in the U.S. Maybe I mean I don't know what those statistics are. I'd have to look them up. But okay, um, food poisoning outnumbers any other type of food contamination. Anybody ever have food poisoning? It's fun, right? Both ends. Oh yeah, yeah. I had it once years ago, and oh my god, yeah, horrible. It's horrible. 
Um, but that's your body saving your life. That's why your diarrhea and vomiting, your body's going, what are you doing? You're trying to kill us? What did you eat? Get it out, right? So your body's amazing, right? Uh, even if you drink too much, right? Anybody who's ever, you know, drank a little too much and gone home bleh, and thrown up, your body is trying to protect you. I'm telling you, your body's amazing. It's amazing, right? Um, these are symptoms of different foodborne illnesses. I'll tell you another fun fact. So hepatitis A, which is one of the viral hepatitis is, 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 right? um, is transmitted through the oral fecal route. So in other words, foodborne. Do you know how many toddlers, if we tested them all, would come up positive for hep A? Because what do toddlers do? Right? Everything in the mouth. Touch this mouth, right? And that's how it's transmitted, right? So, um, but that one is self-limiting, so it's not going to kill you. Hepatitis B, that's the bad one, right? Hepatitis B and hepatitis C are the two that are bloodborne, right? So they're through contact. Uh, and there's also hepatitis D and hepatitis E. Did you know that? Yeah. And they're coming up, I think, with two more also. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, so what's that? Uh, I don't know yet. Yeah. When I teach, I only, it is right now. I, it's just like COVID. There's the Omicron. There's this variant. All viruses and bacteria will mutate. That's what they do. There's no surprise there. So when they were like, oh, newsflash, I'm like, not really. It's not a newsflash. Like that's what viruses do. They mutate. You know, they change the same way we have changed over time. And we've had the ability to adapt right, to our surroundings, right? Think about Cro-Magnum man, Neanderthal man, right? And then here we are. So we've been able to evolve like that and adapt. Bacteria and viruses do the same thing. They change because they want to get inside somebody, you know? Uh, symptoms of foodborne illnesses. If you have bloody diarrhea, absolutely, you should go see someone, right? That's not good. Um, if diarrhea lasts for more than three days, remember this. The very old and the very young, like if a two-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 60-year-old all had the same bug, right? So stomach virus, let's say, and we all had diarrhea. The 20-year-old <clears throat> will be fine, right? The two-year-old and me, well, not me because I'm superior, but another 60-year-old another might get dehydrated really quickly, right? So you have to be really aware of that. So, you know, for, for somebody who's an average healthy adult, you're not going to get dehydrated as quickly as very young, very old. That's kind of the way you have to look at it, right? Uh, prolonged vomiting. If you can't keep anything down at all, yeah, you should go see somebody. Right? Uh, if you can't breathe, probably you need help. Difficulty swallowing, double vision, fever that lasts more than 24 hours. And fevers are a good thing. A fever is your body's way, again, it's, it's uh, a protective mechanism where it's trying to cook out whatever is making you sick, whatever the pathogen is. So it's not a bad thing unless you can't bring it down and it stays, right? If it lasts for more than 24 hours, kids can have seizures. They're called febrile seizures. Um, and even adults can if it's a persistent high running temperature. So um, Headache with muscle stiffness and fever, um, nuchal rigidity, which is a stiff neck and photophobia, which is you can't tolerate light, go along with a headache. That's um, spinal meningitis symptoms. So you want to go see somebody. Uh, numbness, muscle weakness, tingling sensations, rapid heart rate, fainting, and dizziness. If you faint, you probably want to go see somebody. Uh, let's see. Here's some examples of foodborne infections, the norovirus. Norovirus will run through a nursing home in like a day and everybody will have it. And they will all have vomiting and diarrhea. It's, it's insane. Um, cramps, fever, vomiting, diarrhea, right? They're the symptoms. Um, Staph aureus, um, Clostridium botulinum, botulism, right? Um, that's the most deadly because that affects your nervous system. And believe it or not, you know, Botox that people get injected with, that's botulism. That's because it paralyzes the nerves, but it's in little doses. 
Um, what else? Ha acquiring a foodborne illness. Um, this has got to be a typo in this. Caused by eating foods containing natural 80% caused by, like that sentence makes no sense at all. Um, I'll just, I'll synopse it for you guys. There are processes that we have in place like pasteurization, right? Pasteurization of milk is removing bacteria and stuff so that, you know, you can drink milk and not worry about getting poisoned, right? Um, sometimes you'll hear on the news, you know, there's E. coli or whatever, you know, in, in, in the spinach or in the kale. It's never in the Twinkies though. Never, right? Never. It's always in like the vegetables and stuff, right? So, you know, that when you buy fresh things, just wash them, right? That's the thing. Washing, and it doesn't have to be antibacterial. Soap and water, soap and water, soap and water, soap and water. Amazing what soap and water can do, right? Um, hazard analysis, the critical control point system. So that's, you know, our country, we have the FDA and we have a lot of oversight so they can, you know, make sure that the foods are safe. Even though sometimes things slip through, especially dog food, Anybody that's got a pet, right? Sometimes you'll see dog food that's contaminated. But there are some countries out there where, I mean, they might not have any regulation. Um, always wash your hands before you eat. Um, when you go out to eat, and you know, I was a waitress before I became a nurse, 1979. And that's, that's a scary number, isn't it? When you hear that? scary when I say it, 1979, Valley's Park Place when they first opened. But anyway, um, you know, foodborne illnesses like hepatitis A, right? If the cook's having a bad day, like they didn't used to have signs that said employees wash your hands because we just figured you knew that, you know, if you, if you went potty, you should probably wash your hands before you touch my food, right? But then we realized and they started putting those signs up in the bathrooms, which is insane to me, but, you know, can't account for everyone and their, and their lack of common sense. So, you know, um, you always make sure that, you know, you're, you're being cognizant of where your food's coming from. I mean, there's sometimes where I order a pizza and I'm like, oh, I don't know, but I want that pizza. <laughs> and oftentimes too, when food is cooked, right, the heat alone will cook you know, bacteria out of it, right? Most bacteria can't withstand those high temperatures. Um, a lot of them can't withstand the cold. That's why it's important to refrigerate, especially things like with dairy, like with mayonnaise, like potato salad and macaroni salad. Get them in the fridge. Like you go to a picnic and that sits out all day in the sun. Please don't eat it. You'll be sorry. You know, yeah, right? Look at that face. That was like, Ugh. Keep your kitchen clean. Wash your hands. I mean, we're now we're getting repetitive. Uh, there's a little chart here that tells you about storage times and temperatures that are safe levels for food storage. Um, and usually if something is bad, it will have an odor. Not always, right? So, and that's the last slide. So we got through that chapter. Let me stop the recording. Stop the share.